Hello everybody, welcome back to Beacon Pines Part 4. In the last episode, we found out the sad ending, I believe. And now we left off with a new character named Nat. And he tells us that the town Beacon Pines itself is a replica? Let's hop in and find out. The Source Nat expressed his sympathy with a shrug and sauntered off as unassumingly as he'd arrived. He'd given Luca and Iggy what they needed, and nothing more. As Luca sprinted across the snow, the events of the past few days became clearer, pieces to a larger puzzle. Rollo said he was underground somewhere, captured. Mr. Kerr tried to cover it up with lies. The clipboards were hell-bent on capturing Iggy. It all seemed to point to perennial harvest. But right now, there was one thing that Luca needed to know. Luca stopped dead in his tracks. The tree was gone, uprooted and moved, leaving a raw gash in the earth. He dropped to his knees and dug wildly at the cold snow. His numb hands hit something hard, a headstone. A dry whisper escaped Luca's lips. You're here. All this time I thought I was visiting you. Oh my gosh. But you've been here alone in the snow. Dad, I'm so sorry. They ruined your favorite spot in the world. Our favorite spot in the world. Dad, what do I do? There was no reply. Just snow-covered silence. Why'd you give me the slip like that? What if I couldn't find you, you jerk? Iggy finally noticed the tears welling in Luca's eyes and the snow-covered grave. Oh, Iggy, they... they stole his tree, Iggy. Yikes. Suddenly, they heard the crunch of approaching footsteps in the snow. We gotta hide. Two, five, nine, K. Fall off distance, still good. Dude, did you hear me? I said 259. Sorry. You ever think about what we did here? We saved a whole town of people. Doesn't feel like it sometimes. What about everything we left behind? That's the grave of someone with a family. Oh. The people who love them will never know the truth. <gasps> Luca's gonna know, though. The truth is overrated. He bent down to scoop up a snowball and lobbed it playfully. Hey, don't be such a downer, dude. We took this job to change the world. Yeah, come on. It's almost lunchtime. <laughs> and he just dances. Weirdo. Here I thought I was a jerk. These dinguses are out here literally dancing on graves. Luca stuttered through heaving sobs. I thought I was visiting him. I thought he was with me. Not gonna lie, that's a bad break. Here's some advice. Iggy gave Luca a solid smack on the back of his head. Hey! Who's any of this helping? What? Sitting here in the snow crying like some pushover? Who you helping? Iggy, look what they did. They lied to everyone. Blah, blah, blah. Luca Van Horn, you're a lot of things, but you ain't no pushover. What did I tell you before? When some jerk comes at you, acting like a horse's ass. I should stand up for myself. Hell yeah. Kerr and his merry little band of clipboards pulled off this switcheroo for a reason, right? Nat mentioned something about a source. Luca wiped his eyes with a sleeve. Whatever is at the source must be awfully valuable to perennial harvest. Sure, would be a shame if something unfortunate were to happen to their precious source, wouldn't it? What do you have in mind? If it's small enough to steal, we snatch it. If it's too big to snatch, we smash it. And what if it's too big to smash? Iggy flashed a mischievous smile and cracked his knuckles. I'm always up for a challenge. <laughs> I'm going to make this right, Dad, I promise. Let's do this. I 
can get awful cold out there in those woods, Luca. Probably best you two stay put and conserve your energy. Help's on the way. Where's Rolo? Where's my mom? Did you kill her? Oh heavens no, do I seem like a killer to you? Iggy and Luca shared a skeptical look. Well, do I? Aw, shucks. Now that hurts my feelings. <laughs> Screw that guy. Wait a minute. If this is the original town, then that means... Iggy darted behind a large pine and began digging furiously. He emerged holding a shoebox with a crude skull painted on its lid. What's that? Long story. So a few years back, I, uh, came into possession of some premium-grade fireworks. Not the wimpy firecracker stuff they give kids. The good stuff. So why did you bury it under a tree? That's the long part of the story. You and Rolo were doing chores at Rolo's chicken coop. Oh! And you guys pissed me off for some reason or another. Luca rolled his eyes with realization. No, you didn't. Iggy stifled a chuckle. Yep, I just wanted to give you guys a little scare, but like I said, these were some primo fireworks. So I might under underestimate things. You blew up the chicken coop? Incendiary redecoration. Sorry, but you should have seen the looks on your faces. Rilla got grounded for months, which is why I needed to stash the evidence and lay low. So I buried him under that tree. But when I came back from later, they were gone. I figured some grown-up found them and tossed them. Iggy triumphantly raised the shoebox. Turns out it wasn't the fireworks that got moved. It was us. Oh, that's crazy. To imagine they moved a whole town and built a whole replica. It's crazy. Unbelievable. Do you think this is a game? Newsflash, boyo. You're not a hero. You're a little brat who is in a way over his head. A hero is just someone who refuses to give up. Comics these days are rotting children's brains. Everyone thinks they're a spaceman superhero. I was always partial to Hank Atomic myself. Is that so? Do you really think you have a chance against us? You have no idea how powerful we are. Prepare for blast off, loser. Luca and Iggy inch up and to the edge of the hole with <laughs> bewilderment in their eyes. Arctic air breathed out of the cavern in heaving gusts. Whoa. I can see why they wanted to move us all out of town now. But why would they dig a giant hole? I think this is it. This is the source? It's a dang hole? How do we smash a hole? Oh, it's much more than that, my annoying little friend. Kerr! Where's Rolo? wasn't lying before. He's safe. Well, safer than you two, at least. Drats, it's cold. You just had to drag me all the way out here, didn't you? Mr. Kerr gazed down the abyss in contemplation. It really is something, isn't it? What did you do to our town? What is all of this? Well, that's a doozy of a question. This is the source where they collect the unrefined, uh, scratched the back of his head. Honestly, boys, I don't understand any of this well enough to explain it. Fact of the matter is, I'm not paid to know. What do you mean you don't know? Ain't you in charge? Oh, heavens no. My role is merely to flash a winning smile and manage various complications. Complications like us? You are a smart boy. His face contorted into a saccharine grin. It really is nothing personal. Some people are destined to strive for greatness. 
and others are simply obstacles along the way. Seems like you are destined to be a creepy lackey. The point is that we all play our part in life. Mine just happened to be a lead in the role of a lifetime. And you happen to be extras ready for your curtain call. We aren't giving up without a fight. Your smile's not going to be so winning after we're done with you. Now boys, there's no need for a melodrama. It makes even a professional such as myself embarrassed for you. Let's change the mood a bit. Curse snapped his fingers. Scene change. There, that's better. Deal with them. Iggy turned to Luca with a sly glance. Why are you smirking? Because I have a box full of fireworks and you don't. Iggy waved the box into the air, threatening to drop it down the hole. Stop. Let's not do something regrettable. Jokes on you, regret is one of my specialties. Out of curiosity, what would happen if I threw these in your precious hole? Nothing, nothing at all. You're a terrible liar. I'll have you know, I'm an exceptional liar. That's far enough. Iggy plucked a single bottle rocket from the box and held it up with reverence. Stop, you fool. Call off your goons. After a long pause, Mr. Kerr flung up his hand with frustration. Very well. You all can head back for the night. It's been a long day. I'll handle these two from here. Mr. Kerr sighed into the frigid air. It's just us now, Iggy. You can put that down. What, like this? With a nonchalant flick, Iggy <laughs> tossed the firework into the hole. Ooh. Whoa. With a growl, Kerr leapt at Iggy, crashing through Luca. Oh my gosh, look at his face. <gasps> Iggy tried to twist away, but in the struggle, they both tumbled over the side. Luca dove forward, bracing Iggy's hand just before it slipped. His oh grip gosh. was made precarious by the cold, wet snow. He could see Kerr further down, clinging to Iggy's coat. You reckless child, what have you done? Luca, listen to me. Hold on tight and use the walkie-talkie to call them back. How, um, what channel do I use? It doesn't make a damn difference, they're always listening. If you do that, the clipboards will just haul us up and snag us both. The only way you get out of this is if Kerr is out of the picture. Just let go and save yourself. If he lets go, we both die. I don't want to die, but seeing the look on your face almost makes it worth it. Mr. Kerr, you've had a long life. Why don't you actually do something selfless and just let go? Mr. Kerr gasped with insult. <laughs> I don't think he's that type of guy, Luca. Long life? I'll have you know, I can still play 25. You should have heard me sing the part of Phileas Young. With a wild look in his eye, Mr. Kerr began to hum a proud melody. Prum dum dum. <laughs> Them <laughs> wow, can you believe this guy? Luca's hand began to cramp. His voice began to crack. Kerr just let go. No can do if you want to save your friend, you'll have to save me too. Luca, look at me. It's okay. Luca felt Iggy loosen his grasp. You aren't going to kill your friend like that, are you? in Luca's body burned. I'm not his friend. Yes, you are. No, I'm just a no-good bully. Like you, Kerr. Iggy, no. Luca felt his hand slipping. And I told you what you need to do with the bullies. I can't. It's your only way out of this mess. Two birds with one stone. Aw, oh, but Iggy, you're not a bully no more. It makes sense for us to fall together. Wackadoos travel in packs. A calm settled over Iggy's face. Luca, let me do this. Iggy's voice was colder than the bitter air billowing from the chasm. 
Iggy is uh, just a child and he's talking like this. Let me do the right thing for once. Shoot, now we get to choose. I'm refusing. Luca had no choice but to refuse Iggy's request. He tightened his grip and reached for the walkie-talkie in his pocket. A wild delight crept onto Mr. Kerr's face. That's a good lad. Now, radio for help. Iggy begged Luca with his eyes one last time, but Luca pressed the button and called out. We, we need help. Mr. Kerr is in danger. It wasn't long before they were once again surrounded by clipboards. Mr. Kerr sighed with relieved frustration. There you are. You really are a worthless lot, aren't you? <laughs> mirror, now. A clipboard dutifully produced an ornate ivory hand mirror, and Mr. Kerr began preening his tussled hair. Ah, that's better. Mr. Van Horn, I applaud your sharp thinking under duress. I'll put in a good word for you with the founder. Take them away. A swarm of hands overpowered Luca. The last thing he saw before a cloth bag was pulled over his head was the defeated look on Iggy's face. The end. <laughs> Dang, I didn't want it to end like this. <laughs> I thought we could keep going. Hmm. I think this was one of those times where doing the right thing was the wrong thing. Oh, okay. <sighs> okay, I guess I will accept I'm gonna kill Iggy. had no choice but to accept Iggy's request. With a quiet blink, Luca watched a teardrop sail down into the howling void. As his fingers slowly gave up, he met eyes with Iggy. Good. Oh my gosh. So sad. The two silhouettes were swallowed by darkness. to make it happy. Hell of a goodbye, Iggy. Luca, you should really step back. What? Quickly. He didn't even move. Curious. But of course, those fireworks of Iggy's must have been just the right amount of energy. We should get out of here before perennial harvest arrives. Not until you tell me what just happened. Your friend's sacrifice just saved this town. For a little while, anyway. How? Tempus liquamine is a peculiar substance. It can change the relationship between matter and time itself. But doing so requires unfathomable energy. In a closed system, that energy can only come from its surroundings. A useful side product of this property being, by adding precisely the correct amount of energy to it, one can create a cryogenic cascade. So the gunk makes things cold, and the fireworks made the whole freeze over. That's one way of putting it, yes. As dumb luck would have it, the fireworks weren't strong enough to generate a runaway reaction. A shudder to think what would have happened in that case. We have some idea what that would look like. Yeah. It will take them a good while to safely break, though, and access the source again. If you know all of this stuff, why haven't you been helping? I have been, in my way. Each one of us has our role to play. Iggy's role, it turns out, was to buy us precious time. Mine has been to observe and wait. Wait for what? You. Me? Why? What's my role? A fierce twinkle flashed in Nat's eyes. Luca Van Horn, you are going to save the world. With a chuckle, Nat turned and walked west. Dumbfounded, Luca followed behind him, trudging through the snow. Every step taking him further away from everyone and everything he knew, and closer to destiny.
to be continued in Beacon Pines, Pines Harder. <laughs> Revenge served cold. Second time's a charm? Wait, that's it? This ends with a crummy cliffhanger just when it was getting good? I was even starting to like Iggy. No way. I refuse to be associated with some never-ending parade of sequels. Let's go back and find something more definitive. Oh, okay. Um... Oh, uh, we can go all the way back to the other ending. So instead of the ending that we just went through, where he went to the other ending, where I thought was the ending, where we have Gran about to throw a bomb into the hole instead, and Mr. Nuncreed was trying to stop her. Instead of crying, we're going to hum. And in the stillness, he began to hum. After the death of his father, Luca had trouble sleeping. Each night, his mother would sit at the foot of his bed and hum a gentle melody. It was the only thing that could calm his mind. The only thing that, however briefly, could make it all seem okay. That melody pervaded every memory Luca had of his mother. Shivering in the raw snow, he began to hum it out loud. slowly set in. Her heart sank. Those countless nights of consolation, the incomparable loss they shared together. She let the torch fall to the snow and sizzle out. A few steps toward Luca was all she could bear before dropping to the snow herself. Through a flood of tears, she began to hum along, note for note. Astonishment. The last time he heard that melody was the last night he saw his mother. How do you know? I'm so sorry, my little buckaroo. Buckaroo? The only people who call me that are my dad and... <gasps> Your mother. Luca blinked through blurry, watery eyes, trying to see more clearly. He could just make out the impression of a familiar face. He peered across the snowscape at the woman on her knees. Something about her was undeniably his mother. Oh my gosh, you did not notice this? Till now? Only smaller, older, changed. Mom? That's right, Buckaroo. Mom? Wow. Luca sprinted as fast as he could toward his mother. They held each other close and the cold retreated from their bodies. El Eleanor? I thought you were gone. You should have known I would never abandon my son. Eleanor looked down at Luca, tightening her embrace in an appeal for forgiveness. How? You're a smart man, Joseph. I thought you would have it pieced it together by now. You were exposed. Mom, I don't understand any of this. What happened to you? Where did you go? Why did you leave me? Oh my gosh, did she get touched by the goo and then her hair turned gray? I never left you. I was always right here, Luca. Why did you lie to me? It tore me up, Luca, but I did it to keep you safe. I thought that getting answers would help us both move on. But the more I discovered, the more I realized the danger we were in. Until perennial harvest was stopped, it was better if everyone thought I was gone. You could have trusted me. These are bad people, Luca. They won't stop until they get what they want. And they don't care who gets hurt in the process. Then what do we do? We have to stop them. 
Joseph slumped into the cold, wet snow. They can't be stopped. This is too big. I tried beating them at their own game. I'm done fighting fire with fire. For the first time in a long time, her voice felt like her own again. No more lies. I see now there's a better way to stop perennial harvest. The cold hard truth. Luca gazed down at Nuncrete with pity. He looked small. Joseph stared into the snow, as if searching it for answers. Come on, everyone. We've got a party to crash. You don't understand. He always wins. Hmm. Chapter 9. The Devil You Know. Seven months ago, Eleanor Van Horn crept down the maze of sterile hallways under perennial harvest. She stopped in front of the large steel door marked Deep Engineering. No turning back now. She raised a trembling hand. The stolen keycard worked as promised, and the door buzzed open with mechanical efficiency. She was immediately hit with the smell of disinfectant. It was some sort of laboratory. In one corner was a desk covered in papers. Across the room stood a tall metal pod with hoses protruding from its base. She rushed to the desk and began shifting through the piles of papers. They were experiment reports on something called Tempus Liquimen. There were dozens of them. Every one stamped, failed. Eleanor heard the sharp echo of footsteps approaching. She was out of time. Her eyes scanned the room, eventually landing on the strange pod. Muttering a curse under her breath, she dashed over and dove inside. And that is what change is all about. Oh, so we went all the way back to his infamous speech. Instead of Luca being there to listen. Grabbing the future by the scruff of the neck and making things happen. Change is a choice. I am tickled pink that we will all be making that choice together. How great is that? This man is a liar. Excuse me? I will not. This town has a dangerous secret, and perennial harvest only exists to keep it hidden. Nonsense. They picked up the whole damn town and moved it right under our noses. You aren't making any sense, dear. Mr. Kerr addressed the crowd with a sarcastic tone. Imagine such a thing. It's absurd and just plain impossible. They promised they could fix the file harvest. They told us they would clean this place up. We just had to leave town for a few days. <gasps> That's right! Lucas said to Beck that they moved everybody out of town. But while they had us evacuated, Mrs. Hartford, I'm afraid I'm going to have to ask you to. You're afraid of a lot of things, aren't you? You sniveling little worm. This is growing tiresome. A little help, please? Don't you all see? This festival is a sham. An excuse to have the whole town gather in one place. They're planning something awful. I don't know what, but these people are wicked. Don't listen to her. She has absolutely no proof. I am the proof. I'm Eleanor Van Horn. Whispers filtered through the crowd. Well, aren't you just sneaky as the Dickens? We all knew Valentine's fertilizer was too good to be true. And now this whole town is paying the price. Ladies and gentlemen, I am so sorry about this disruption. My associates will take this obviously disturbed woman somewhere comfortable so that she can get the help she needs. She's not the one who's disturbed. You two timing clown. You all know there's something wrong with this town. It was just easier to look the other way. The truth is, That's quite enough, Mr. Nuncreed. Torment dragged on Joseph Nuncreed's face. Yes, sir. 
Take them away. No, I want them to see this. Ah, uh, the ever-temptuous Eleanor Van Horn. You've been quite the thorn in my side. Like a weed that's burrowed in where it doesn't belong. I must confess, you look dreadful. He paused for a moment, plucking a piece of fuzz from his sweater and discarding it to the ground. Consider yourself in rare company. You've managed to pull one over on me. It won't happen again. I knew you had some sort of plan to disrupt our little party. Solomon, you sneaky little... Oh my gosh, he's a bad guy? But alas, I expected something a bit more impressive than incoherent rambling. No matter, your failures are yours to bear. N Mr. Kerr. Yes, sir? It's a shame it was cut short, but I thank you for the rousing oratory. I will take it from here. Yes, sir, of course, sir. You have done quality work for me, William. You can look forward to the recom You can look forward to the recompense we agreed upon. Kerr gave a bow of deference. Founder, you are most gracious. Gasps rippled through the crowd. Thankfully, we can dispense with the formalities from here on out. Solomon pulled a glass vial from his pocket. In one smooth motion, he downed its contents. A triumphant smile grew across Solomon's lips. You can all call me Sharper Valentine. <gasps> His body and face began to contort and expand as he disappeared into a belching green mist. Guys. Oh my god. A hushed horror gripped the crowd. <gasps> This is a story about change. Holy crap. What? No. That's what I'm thinking. Uh-huh. So you didn't see that coming. <gasps> no, we didn't. <laughs> Good. Sharper examined his new hands. Well, this is quite the improvement. Everything looks so much smaller now. Eleanor was right about one thing. This festival was a ruse. I wanted you all to witness my glorious return with your own eyes. Why does everyone look so downtrodden? This is a celebration, people. Maybe it would help if we set the mood. Mr. Kerr, be a dear and reveal the sign. Mm. Ha! Wonderful. Sharper choked out a crude squawk of a laugh. Frustrated grumbles sprinkled through the crowd. Sharper, you malicious bastard. I'm glad you're back so I can tell you to your face. You destroyed this town. We ain't gonna let you get away with it again. Sorry, this is not the time for audience participation. Some assistance, Mr. Kerr? William Kerr gave a subtle nod to the clipboards. You coward. Does anyone else have something to contribute? A helpless quiet settled over the crowd. I thought so. Did you all truly believe you could be free of me? A town of complete and utter fools. You people should be celebrating my return. You're clearly lost without me. And that leads me nicely to my children. Daddy? Oh. <laughs> This is the first time he's actually happy, like he looks happy. <laughs> I gave you both the greatest gift a parent can give. The opportunity to prove yourselves in my absence. Squandered. Oh, <laughs> back to being sad. To say I am disappointed would be an understatement. But I silence Augustus. An adult is speaking. I don't know which is worse, a son who is completely hopeless or a daughter with such potential who, inev who inevitably lets me down. Eris, you fill me with admirable consistency. Thankfully, I was counting on it this time. Father, I have been wasting time, my dear. What have you accomplished? I was focused on cementing our legacy. Legacy? 
Who needs a legacy when you can just live forever? But what about, it's all right, kiddo. I'm afraid you suffer from a complete lack of imagination. There's just no helping it. Now then, where is Joseph? You didn't take the opportunity to slip off, did you? Ah, uh, there he is. Everyone should give him a hand. None of this would have been possible without Joseph. I think you've said enough. Nonsense. The people deserve to know how helpful and loyal you've been. I only did what I did because he left me no choice. You always had a choice, Joseph. You were simply too weak to take it. No matter. Cheer up. You are about to be rich beyond your wildest dreams. You should follow Mr. Kerr's example. When I found him, he was in a sorrier state than any of you. An aging actor, desperate to recapture his youth. He played his part, and soon he'll be able to play the leading man again. Forever, in fact, if he remains loyal. That goes for all of you. Well, those who haven't already frittered away my goodwill. Beacon Pines is mine again. And I am willing to share its spoils in exchange for absolute loyalty. Are you saying William Kerr was never in charge of perennial harvest? Ha! <laughs> you think that puffed up blatherskite could have accomplished all of this? Don, I suppose it's time for your big exclusive. Sharper addressed the crowd with indignant pride. He'd planned this moment for so long that now, at the deed's fruition, it almost felt frivolous. You see, I needed a figurehead to hold things down while I orchestrated my return. Someone to misdirect, lie, and bilk this town for a spell. So I invented William Kerr. Take your bow, you've earned it. Mr. Kerr flourished a preposterously elaborate bow. Patrick C. Montesquieu. <gasps> Thespian extraordinaire at your service. Founder, I just want to thank you again for this opportunity. It truly was the role of a lifetime. Wait, so this Bill Kerr was at Pat C the whole time? Now that your secret is out in the open, what's to stop this town from rising up against you? Oh, that's the delicious part. Fear. Thanks to our clipboards, I know what each and every person in this town fears most. Oh, crap. And I will make those fears manifest for anyone who steps out of line. The choice is simple. I'm not afraid of you. Ha, <laughs> the young hero. I've kept a keen eye on you, boy. You and your friends made a habit of disrupting my plans. What a pity. If things would have gone a bit differently, you might have had your moment of triumph. But that's fate for you. You can't do this. Oh, but I can. I have won. Never underestimate what a great man can do given time. And now time is my plaything. Perhaps the most expensive thing I've ever bought. But well worth it. Ha! <laughs> Sharper coughed up one final laugh and cracked his knuckles. Enough chit chat. Let's get to work, shall we? And so, Sharper set about remaking the town in his own image. The fertilizer factory soon reopened for business. Sales rose steadily as more and more farmers across the countryside began to swear by its miraculous properties. Beacon Pines became famous, a secretive town that, for the right price, shared its gifts with all. Gifts that became more and more necessary in a world where winters grew longer and longer. The end. Oh, wow. This is wrong, but things are becoming clearer now. You can feel it, right? We can't let Sharper win. He might just be the key to this whole thing. Let's see. Yeah, let us see. Malice. Windows to the soul. Okay, let's check that one out. a malice lurking behind those eyes, like a trap ready to spring. 
Luca felt the weight of Nuncrete's hand on his shoulder. Something wasn't right. He didn't know why, but something was telling Luca to get out of there. I just want this to all be over. Of course, I'm sure it will all work out soon enough. I should get going. I told Roxy I'd check for Rolo at the treehouse. That's right. We went all the way back to when Rolo was missing. Luca twisted free of Nuncrete's grasp. Of course. Luca, you know your dad and I were good friends back in the day. You can come to me with anything. Anything at all. No, I'd rather not. Oh, now that I know, I don't like him. These festival decorations are a bit humdrum. Now, if I were to throw a festival, it would be a thing to behold. I agree, this is all more than a little sad. It's worse than sad. It's boring. What if we did a little something to spice things up? I'm listening. You know that festival sign waiting to be unveiled? It would be a shame if someone- The two scurried off, eagerly formulating a plan. No, I want to know! Now that I know what's under the, the sign. Identify yourself, please. Nellie Moodwell. I work here now. I'm unable to locate you on our staff roll. Oh, I don't officially start until tomorrow. Mr. Kerr said I could come in early tonight to get a few things done. Hold, please. Clearance authorized. Thank you. Our harvest awaits. Whoa. You can get a wrench to the noggin sneaking up on a guy like that. Don't scare a man while he's junkin', Sonny. Evening, Jeff. Isn't it kind of late to be junkin'? I might as well ask the same thing of you. Find anything good? Bah. Ever since perennial harvest moved in, even the junk and trash. You can learn a lot about a person by looking at what they throw away. With this bunch, it's all shredded paper and coffee cups. Well, I better get going. I didn't see nothing if you didn't see nothing. See what? Exactly. Oh, yeah, that's right. We can fish again. Let's fish. Oh, did we already get them all? I guess so. Never mind. Luca, some fish. Hello? He aired a long holler into the woods. Rollo! <sighs> Rollo, wherever you are, I hope you're okay. Luca felt his eyes getting heavy and plopped into the beanbag. He conceded to its lumpy embrace. <sighs> Once again, Luca found himself in a vast black expanse. This time, he knew exactly where to go. He took a single confident step forward. The world flickered and pulsed. He found himself standing in front of the frigid air of a blazing campfire. The source. He plopped down cross-legged and gazed into the cold flame, waiting. Soon enough, the fire began to die out, popping sporadically until all that was left was a single ember. Luca stood up and dusted himself off. He plucked the glowing ember from the cold ash, examined it, and slid it into his pocket, a keepsake. The voice of his father spoke behind him. You made me proud, buckaroo. Luca turned to face him. Dad, what is this place? A warm grin grew across his father's face. A place where everything that has been and everything that could be all wait together. Luca found himself staring at his father's face, trying as hard as he could to memorize every single detail. Wait? For what? Another voice spoke out, 
As Lucas Doppelganger stepped forward, that's up to you. Without knowing why, Luca began to weep. Is... is any of this real? Are you real? Luca's father bent down to smudge away a tear. Of course, I'm as real as the part of you that misses me. Luca turned to look at the older version of himself. And you? The doppelganger choked back tears. I'm as real as the part of you that's angry he's gone. Does that make sense? Through his tears, Luca laughed. <laughs> I think so. His father pulled him in for an embrace. Time to go, buckaroo. Luca was startled from his dream by a banging on the floor. Are you in there? A commanding voice rumbled from below. Just as Luca sprang to lock the entry hatch, the door knocked open. Oh. Chapter 5. Dangers Big and Small Luca stumbled back. He heard the rope ladder creak under significant weight. Keeping his eyes fixed on the hatch, he inched backward to the balcony. As his hand grasped the door handle, Luca froze. A large figure clumsily wriggled up through the hole. Oh my gosh, it's older Rolo? Stop right there, or I'll... Sheesh, I know it's dark and all, but I figured you'd recognize me. Oh my gosh, Rolo is so handsome. <laughs> Who are you? The large figure cocked its head inquisitively. Stop now or I'll clobber you with a baseball bat. Whoa, 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 take it easy. Luca, you need to get your eyes checked. It's me, Rolo. Nice try, but I know you aren't Rolo. You're like one of his random uncles or something. <laughs> Where is he? <laughs> Uncle? Luca quit messing around. It's me. If it really is, you prove it. <sighs> Flamin' chicken coop, Luca. Luca's jaw dropped. He peered more closely at the man standing in front of him. Something about him was undeniably Rolo, only bigger, older, changed. How? Huh? What happened to you? When I was running away, I ran into more people in those yellow suits. They grabbed me and dragged me away. What? Where did they take you? Dunno, they threw a bag over my head. It was cold and smelt like swimming pool. I think it was an underground lab or something. They made me... They made my hands all big. Look! Rolo proudly presented his hands to Luca. Pretty sweet, right? I mean, it wouldn't be my first pick for a superpower. But beggars can't be choosers. Rolo, it wasn't just your hands. My feet too? Dang, Pacha's made me new shoes. Wait, Luca, why are you so small? Luca moved to the side and pointed Rolo to his reflection in the balcony window. What the? His hands shot up to his face. Holy Toledo. Rolo, what did they do to you? They made me drink some sort of green crud. Ew. Actually, it wasn't too bad. It kind of tasted like licorice. <gasps> I passed out and woke up like this. And then I sort of smashed open my cage and escaped. Whoa, you smashed open a cage? Kinda. At least I think I did. It's all a bit of a blur. They had you in a cage? Who are these people? I don't know who did this to you, but we're gonna fix it. Fix it? This is awesome. Well, I'm just glad you're safe now. Luca, you don't need to worry about me. Sure, I got snatched, but look at it this way. I got snatched. I know where snatch people go. <laughs> we may finally have a lead on what happened to your family. Maybe you're right, but this all seems dangerous. Danger? Ha. Huh. Rollo shadowboxed a few jabs. I'll take them all on. Oh my gosh. He... Wait, she has blue hair now. Hey, fellas, what's up? With a yelp, Rolo dove behind Luca. Take cover. Did I come at a bad time? Who the heck are you? This is Beck. Sorry, something truly bizarre just happened, and I need help. I don't know where else to go. 
So you're just hanging out here with your large adult friend? <laughs> oh no, this is my buddy Rolo. This is your missing friend. One and the same. He seems a little old. I'll have you know, this is a recent development. What the heck does that mean? Oh, I'm sorry, you're the one who just showed up out of nowhere. So, we'll be asking the questions here. That's fair. How did you find us? Your silly little treehouse? I think you mean our silly little mission control? I hate to break it to you, but your secret path isn't so secret. And I could hear your racket from a mile away. See, Luca, this is why we need to improve security around here. Not now, Rolo. Beck, you said something bizarre happened. Yeah, but she shot a nervous glance at Rolo. Anything you can say around me, you can say around Rolo. This has been a weird day all around, hasn't it? Yep. Beck's eyes narrowed. Okay, so it all started when I made it back home. My first order of business was to try to salvage my hair. That's right. She got ooze in her hair. It turned gray. So I dyed it with some stuff from the chemistry set my mom gave me. Okay, just need to play it cool and hope no one notices. Notices what? Oh, nothing. I was just... Come over here and let me have a look. Oh, honey, what in the world did you do to your hair? I just kind of felt like a change. This is going to take forever to grow out. You were the one who said that change was a good thing, right? <laughs> Look at her smile. I was talking about your mother's new job. I was talking about us moving. Well, I guess I just took your lesson to heart. Ilona tried to put on a smile. Before I forget, I came up here to tell you that Nellie had to go into work. Tonight? Her and Mr. Kerr decided it would be good for her to get some things done before tomorrow. That Kerr guy seems like a grade A creep. Beck. He is him and his weird cult of personality. You are not going to ruin this job for Nellie. It means too much to her. Oh, I know exactly how much it means to her. It means enough to her to exile her daughter to this podunk town. This place sucks. The people are weird. You just don't know them yet. It's always cold. We're in the mountains. You'll get used to it. I can't even pick up a single decent station on the radio. It's all banjo music and farm reports. You know, I grew up in a town not that different from this one. Is that why you're better at talking to plants than people? Oh my gosh. So sassy. Okay. So, here's what we're gonna do. First of all, you're grounded. What? In the morning, I'll have Nellie come and see what we can do about fixing your hair. You need to look presentable for the festival. But not another peep. She sighed, and after a moment, looked down at Beck sympathetically. What's wrong with her fit? I like it. I know moving is hard, honey. But that doesn't mean you have to make yourself miserable all the time. Other people seem to have that covered for me. Oh, and if you decide to rebel by dyeing your hair more? She flashed a sly grin and tussled Beck's hair. I'll just shave it off for you. Think of how rebellious you'll look then. Very funny. Thank you. Good night, sweetie. Good night, Mom. Wait, 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 wait. First of all, this town does not suck. Second, you need help because you got grounded? No. I'm sorry you got in trouble. It's my fault your hair got screwed up in the first place. Don't worry about it. I actually kind of like this look. I like it too. Great. Can we get back to the story now? This next part is the important bit. I have this radio I upgraded with my mom and I was too angry to sleep. So I tried to dial in something worth listening to. Mr. Kerr, are you there? Mr. Kerr? Yes, I'm busy. What is it? Apologies, I have the founder on the line. Patch him through immediately. One moment. Hello, sir? It's so nice to hear from you. It's 
skip the pleasantries. What's a report on our new lead researcher of deep engineering? Nellie Moodwell seems to be interrog- integrating nicely. At this very moment, she's working to help us meet our deadline. She offered to work overtime before I even had the chance to do- suggest it. Excellent. And you have faith that she's capable of finishing the work left by her predecessor? Her work must be complete before this festival. I will make sure she stays day and night until it's accomplished. Good, you know how I feel about loose ends. Yes, sir. Once she has finished the work, we need to make a de- determination regarding her. Long-term prospects in the company. Immediately, sir? I usually have more time to fully bring people into the fold. We are in the end game, Bill. After your failures with Dr. Prescott, I can't afford to take any risks. Of course, sir. No loose ends, sir. Once she finishes the work, she will either leave the office completely committed to perennial harvest, or she won't leave at all. Murder? Perfect. Sir, if I might suggest, maybe we should delay just for a bit. Oh? It's just we seem to be rushing to hit this festival deadline. And rushing into things has caused some issues in the past. I see. Please understand that I just want what's best for you. I'm eternally grateful for all that you've done for me. Bill, I have make this very clear for you. I brought you in to make things run smoothly. Not to have opinions. Of course, sir. Chin up, Bill. You are only a few days away from having everything you ever dreamed of. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Whoa. Yeah. Just so we're clear, when they said loose ends, they were talking about murder, right? Like actually killing someone? Capital murder? Luca gave Rollo a quick elbow to the ribs. Who is this founder? I was hoping you guys would know. Nah, as far as we know, Kurt is the top banana at Perino Harvest. He sounded scared of this founder guy. So we have an even topper banana on the field. What the hell is my mom caught up in? Has she talked about the job much? Not really. She said she was going to come in and continue the work of someone she respected. Luca, do you think that body at the warehouse was the person Beck's mom came to replace? <gasps> Probably. That would make sense. Beck, it seems like Nellie's predecessor got um, loose-ended. <laughs> I'm getting that impression. Okay, so we need to get your mom out of there before the festival happens. There's two days away. Won't she just come home after work? The creep on the radio said they were going to hold her there until then. So if she's not coming out, we gotta go in and get her. Beck flicked a large sheet of paper out of her pocket and slammed it on the floor. Maybe this will help. You have blueprints? Well, it's really just a welcome mat for my mom's PH orientation day. But it shows the layout. Sure, looks like blueprints to me. Look, here's the reception area. There's a big room marked Founder's Office. It even has the exits marked. Guys, guys, guys. We have a deadline. We have an objective. We have blueprints. You realize what this is, right? Willow started to wiggle with excitement. I think we're heisting. This is officially a heist. Chapter 6. The Heist. They spent the night's end huddled around that small map, formulating a plan to infiltrate the headquarters of Perennial Harvest. It would be no small feat, a modern facility equipped with all manner of technology, not to mention the swarm of clipboards that would most certainly be scattered throughout. By the time the sun began to peek through the car window used as a makeshift balcony door, all were in agreement. This could just work. The final day before the festival would be used to prepare. They'd need to pull every resource at their disposal, pull every favor with a thread. Even enlist some unsavory characters around town with important tasks only they were suited for. Luckily, there was enough ill will and mistrust toward Perennial Harvest that alliances could be found at a bargain. Luca, Beck, and Rollo rubbed their eyes as they exited the treehouse. They hadn't slept at all that night. There was no time. 
The festival was to begin in one day, and they each had their assignments. All right, quick recap. Rolo, you're gonna talk to Roxy. Quarterly, without her, and Fitz, this whole thing could go bust. Me, Cordial, is my middle name. Uh huh. And how do you plan to explain your he new? He waved vaguely at Rollo's sizable figure. <laughs> Circumstance. Bah. She'll be so happy I'm alive, she won't even notice. Beck snorted an involuntary giggle. And Beck, you're sure Ilona won't just shoot this whole thing down when she hears it? She'll listen. When she understands the danger Nelly is in, the danger we're all in, the plan will make sense. Okay. That leaves me with Jeff, with then Iggy. How are you gonna persuade them? I'll think of something. They each looked at each other with sleepy confidence and. Well, Godspeed. He shook his head. Over? No. Endings are merely a state of mind. This doesn't end until I give up. Wow. I admire the conviction. But can he really pull through? Oh. We're in for it, guys. Where is this little rascal? Hey Jeff, what can I do for you for? Well, I know how much you hate perennial harvest. Hate's a strong word. Oh, sorry, I mean, I didn't say it was the wrong word. <laughs> gotcha. So we're gonna break into their headquarters, and I thought you might be able to help. Jeff wheezed out a long snicker. Hee <laughs> You see, I knew you kids were all right. Great, so you'll help? The joy in Jeff's face drained instantly. Not a chance. But give me one good reason I should risk my hide aiding and abetting you rascals. Looking into the sullen eyes of his would-be accomplice, Luca blurted out the first word that came to mind. Junk. He likes junk, right? Junk. Yeah, what of it? Sonny, I've got more junk than a king has copper. Ain't interested. Crap. Luca wasn't ready to give up so easily. He shouted out again. Fight? I've done enough fighting for one lifetime, and more than my share of losing. Time's come to hang up the gloves. Does he want shit? <laughs> shit! Yeah, it's all shit. I still ain't helping. Ain't that some shit? <laughs> Hi, Jeff's brow perked up. What do you say? Go ahead and hide then. Sensing some traction, Luca carried on with vigor. Let a bunch of kids do what needs to be done. We're not afraid. Jeff's scowl faded with a sigh. Say what you will about old Jeff, and they all do. We will never hear him say, I hid from nothing. One good stomp of the foot was all Jeff needed to drive his point home. Wow, guys, leave it to me to pick the very last one that will work. What was it you kids needed? Some sort of disguise. I've got just the thing. And while we're at it, that crate should come in handy. This ain't gonna be free, you know. I'm thinking five bags of sour gob should cover it. Put it on my tab. Luca offered out his open hand to seal the deal. With a firm and dusty grip, Jeff reciprocated. Done. Swing by first thing in the morning. Okay, now where is Iggy? Hey Tish, look who it is. Luca, are you here to try to tickle us to death again? Look, just hear me out. Iggy raised an eyebrow suspiciously. We're listening. 
Iggy, I know we're both been giant bags of shit. Shit to each other. <laughs> Iggy gave a reluctant shrug. You're not wrong. But lately, life has been kind of... Uh, hard? Hard, you know? Hard? Yeah, well, life's always hard. Get over it, we ain't interested. Crap. Luca knew they'd need Iggy and Tish to pull this off. He tried again. Iggy, I know we, we've both been giant bags of shit. Iggy gave a reluctant shrug. Okay. And it's been strange. Strange, you know? Iggy considered the point. Things have been weird around here. So I'm offering a truce and asking for your help. What do you say we... Uh, break. Break our hostilities, at least for now. We do like breaking things. Even if a truce means less breaking things. What if I told you there was a way to have a truce and break stuff? Go on. I need you to cause a distraction so I can sneak into a perennial harvest HQ. A wild-eyed grin spread across Iggy's face. My, my, Luca Van Horn, I'm impressed. And after this is all done, maybe you and Tish can come hang out at the treehouse sometime. Iggy glanced over to Tish, who nodded in agreement. Fine. But not because we want to see your crappy treehouse. We just like to cause chaos. No, you want to see the treehouse, Iggy. With a quick nod, Luca was off. Did you hear that, Tish? Iggy gazed up at Tish with a smile. He invited us to hang out at the treehouse. A single tear ran down Tish's cheek. I never expected this day to go. <laughs> How wonderful. Chapter 7 all right guys i think i gotta end it there it's nice seeing iggy getting along with luca it's the start of a beautiful friendship as always thank you for watching and i'll see you in the next episode bye